good morning, everybody. Welcome to White House Baptist Church. Let's all take a hymnal and stand, please, and turn to hymn number 180. That's 180. 180. There will never be a sweeter story. Is it the love of Jesus? Something wonderful. Hymn 180. Let's sing together. There will never be come up and open our service in prayer. Pastor Wilkins texted yesterday evening and, and asked that we have Brother uh, Davenport come and open our service. He's the pastor at Hips Chapel in uh, Blue Ridge, Georgia, and his daughter is Amberly uh, McGill. But interesting story about his church. His church is the one that Brother Wilkins, Pastor Wilkins, rang the bell and came back like a big kid wanting to put a bell here. So that's the, <laughs> it's his fault that we're about to get a bell, right? Come on up, brother. <clears throat> Isn't that a way to get a good friendship, put a bell in your church? Okay. <laughs> I really appreciate the teaching this morning. It's very good for me. I told Brother Hamby that uh, the Lord meant for me to be here this morning. There's been very few Sundays that I've ever left the church to go somewhere else on Sunday. And today is one of those. And the Lord has truly blessed me already. I'm looking forward to the message. May God bless Mr. Hamby. Brother Hamby, Pastor Hamby, whatever you want me to call you. <laughs> and thankful for Karen, his wife. May the Lord bless y'all. Now, sometimes don't ever go places and think nobody knows you. You may be from different parts of the country. Now, I've never met this brother Hamby, but his brother, who pastored a church in Cahutta, Georgia, which was about 15 miles from where we lived, I had met him a few times, and I remembered the Hamby. Okay. So pray with me this morning, if you will. There's many things in our nation and our world uh, that needs prayer. But this morning, I think our churches need prayer as much as anything. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, we realize how precious and how great you are. And Father, I, I, I know that there is joy in the hearts of your people, even when there's trials and temptations and troubles and all the things that take us aside and away from your word many times. So I pray, Father, that you will bless us with that knowledge and understanding that your grace and your mercy and your power is greater than anything in this world and that we can lean upon your understanding and not ours we can know that you have everything worked out and that we can trust you. Father, I pray this morning that you'll bless Brother Hamby as he comes to bring the message, that you'll fill him with your Holy Spirit and give him the wisdom that he needs, the knowledge that he needs, and the power from you to preach your word just exactly the way you want him to. And then, Father, we'll glorify you and praise you because it all comes from you. I thank you for the church today, that you will bless the church and strengthen. I pray that every mind in this church today is open unto your word, 
And if there be anyone with us today that are lost, that your word will penetrate their hearts and they'll come to know you. So use us in the way that you see fit and help us to always glorify you and praise you. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, got your bulletins, so we'll go through our announcements real quick. Uh, of course, we do want to welcome Brother Hamby and Miss Karen. Uh, appreciate them coming out and filling in for the pastor, and they'll be here uh, through the month of June, and uh, looking forward to each service with them as well. And then uh, Brother Jerry Smith will be back uh, July 4th and uh, carry us on through until the pastor comes back. Uh, then also, uh, we want to thank those that have been serving and hosting, like Brother Jerry and, and uh, Mr. Hamby as they come through. And uh, if you want to be part of the hospitality team, uh, please uh, see me and let me know, and we'll kind of get you signed up for that as well. Also, June 19th, we've got our next visitation, and that'll be at 10 a.m. And then June 20th is uh, Father's Day, so uh, looking forward to that as well. And then uh, we also got anniversary. We've got uh, Brother Todd and Miss Rebecca. How many years, brother? 16. Congratulations. Uh, Miss Rebecca, we'll pray for you. No. <laughs> no. That's, that's good. Uh, we've got birthdays. We've got Miss Shannon. And, of course, she's in the nursery, so I can't make fun. Oh, well, I guess I can make fun of her since she's back there. No. And then uh, we've got Miss Maisie. Uh, both are on uh, June 7th. So happy birthday to them. And I also want to... So thank you for uh, all those that are that have been praying for Miss Lou, myself, and uh, her surgery. Everything went real well. Uh, the doctors were, were pleased with it. She's still going through uh, a little more discomfort, uh, uh, more of a lot of noise in her ear uh, than anything. Uh, but she's gradually, day by day, getting better. And hopefully she'll be here by next Sunday. Uh, She's just not quite got the strength yet and the stamina. She's still kind of not completely off balance, but a little bit. And uh, But we really appreciate the prayers, appreciate all the food that's brought to us. Uh, now Miss Lou don't want to eat my cooking. She wants other people bringing it in. <laughs> so what's wrong with that? <laughs> but uh, we really appreciate that. We love you, and uh, thank you guys. Stand again, turn him 22. As you're turning him 22, just want to say thank you to all the men and Autumn who was here yesterday and uh, just trimmed up the grounds out front. Things look good. We appreciate that. I love it that there's a church that so many people are involved and, and, and take ownership. So thank you for all that were here and were able to work. Let's, we're on hymn number 22. Hymn 22. Have you been to Jesus for cleansing power? Hymn 22. Are you lost? Thank you. 
was telling somebody this morning, uh, I think it was Brother Roger, I was telling him that I feel like I'm in that minefield with the service. I'm not sure I'm going to step on a mine and blow us all up or not, but we'll do the best we can. If we could have, ask the men to come forward for the offering today. Brother Roger, would you ask God's blessing on the offering, please? Last time we're going to turn him number 248. Him 248, and Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. Amen. Him 248. Now I belong to Jesus. 248. Him 248. Jesus. Aren't you glad we belong to him? If you're saved by the good grace of God, uh, you are saved forever. I appreciate all we have in Christ Jesus. Well, if you turn your Bibles, if you were in a Sunday school class, you're only going to go back a page or two. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. And I'd like to share with you a little bit this morning about the race that is set before us out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. And I know if you... Oh, where I, I'm not sure where I put the crazy thing in my pocket. I love old people. I really love old preachers. <laughs> right, Brother Davenport? <laughs> we good? All right. I learned years ago when I was in Africa to keep my wallet in my front pocket, and it paid off. I, God had his hand in my back pocket one day and, and didn't get any money, praise the Lord, but Anyway, my front pockets are jam-packed full, but uh, anyway, 
forgot where I was going and what I was going to say. It was good. It really was good. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back as a merry-go-round. Honestly, my mind is a merry-go-round. It'll come back, back around, and I'll grab it, and I'm not sure what I'll be saying when it does come back around, but I'll go ahead and say whatever I was going to say when I was supposed to say what I was going to say then. But anyway, <laughs> I really do love old people. You know? <laughs> it is so good. Well, I was thinking about the, what um, Brother Davenport said about the bell. I don't know if you heard the story about the fella, he went to church and he wanted to do some, something for the Lord. Uh, he couldn't teach, he you know, wasn't a good speaker. Um, didn't, he was a little wimpy fella couldn't, and uh, couldn't do much. Well, he told, asked the preacher, he said, preacher, I need to do something, I need to do something. And he said, well, we don't have anybody to ring the bell. And so he said, well, I'll do that, I'll, do, I'll ring the bell. So the next Sunday morning he goes in, he grabs hold of the rope. Well, the, the bell weighed more than he did and it pulled him up. And he wasn't able to ring the bell. But he said, Preacher, please let me ring the bell. I'll, I'll do my best. And he said, okay, I'll give you another chance. Well, that week he said, how in the world am I going to ring that bell? So he decided what he'd do is he'd go up in the bell tower, and instead of trying to pull the rope, he would, he'd ring the bell with his head. So the next Sunday morning, people were coming in. Boy, that bell was just being, you know, ringing, you know, dong, 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 ringing that bell with his head. And so it went on, a few weeks went by, and this, he was getting, his head was getting used to the bell ringing and doing great. And then one day he got excited, he got the ringing that bell, and when the bell went one way, he went the other way, and he fell through the hole. And he landed down on the ground. People were standing around him, and, some, and somebody says, do you know that man laying there? And they said, no, but his face rings a bell. So, <laughs> anyway, Hebrews chapter number 12 I love old people. I really do. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God, um, these three verses of Scripture? I I may go ahead and read down to verse number four, but we'll be dealing primarily with verses uh, one, two, and three. I want to share with you three thoughts today about the race that has been set before us. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame is set down and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Let's pray. Father, how good it has been to be here already in the house of the Lord. Thank you for the wonderful songs we've sung. Thank you for the uh, fellowship that we've had. And I pray that as we're here together to, today, we would honor you with all that we do and all that we say, and that we would leave this place differently than we came in, that you will have met with us, which is the most important thing that could happen, happen to us today, that we would have a special visit from the heavenly, heavenly country. Please have your way. I pray in our hearts and our lives. I pray you'll speak to us through the word of God. And if there's one here today that does not know Christ as Savior, I remember the days that I was under conviction. I remember the times I sat in the pew and the Holy Spirit wooed me and drew me and I resisted. But I'm so glad for the day that I came to Christ and received him as my Savior. I pray that you'd have your will and way in our hearts and lives and everyone that's here today in a special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Let me read you one more verse of scripture. Um, you don't have to turn, but let me read it to you. First Corinthians chapter number nine, verse 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. I remember when I read that verse of scripture that it kind of confused me. And, I, and this is just by way of introduction. There's a couple of things that I found out that I needed to know about running my race. Number one, I needed to know who my opponents were. Who was I running against? So when I, when I read that verse of scripture, you know who I thought my opponents were, who my competitors were? I thought it was other Christians. I'm running against other Christians. So I thought, well, it's my job to do all I can because one, the Bible, that verse, verse of scripture said, one received the prize. So it was my job to do whatever I could by any way I could to run and win the race. I could trip you up, talk about you, be, you know, do anything I can to hurt you, discourage you, to, to make you not win the race. But I got the thing, you know what? Wait a second. How can I be running against other Christians and, and uh, only one of us is going to win the prize? Um, that's not even scriptural. I know that if I'm faithful to God, you're faithful to God, and I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm glad that he would reward us according to our own faithfulness. 
So I began to think about who are my opponents, and I know that there are some ungodly opponents, and Paul even warns us. Let me read you a couple of verses. Philippians chapter number 3, verse 2, beware of dogs. Uh, I read after one writer, he said dogs, those were Jews that had called Gentiles dogs because they had rejected the law of Moses, rejected God because they were outside of, of the law and had no part of God. They called them dogs. You know what happened to these Jews? Uh, they themselves had turned around and had rejected Christ, and now Paul calls them dogs. He says, beware of dogs, those who have rejected Christ and are against him. Uh, he, he says, uh, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Um, we need to beware. He tells us in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, Now I beseech your brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. There are people that we know that we have to avoid, and these are people that we know that are our opponents. They're against everything that's good and everything that's God. But I also know that I have some other opponents that I need to, to understand and be aware of. Uh, I know that I have to be aware of the world, but also I have to be aware of Satan, who is always and constantly, he's constantly out to get me and out to trip me up to cause me not to win the race. I know also that I have my own flesh, and I guess if there's one enemy that's against me more than any of the other enemies, it's got to be me, and I cause more trouble for me than anybody else ever could, and a lot, of, a lot of blame that I throw at the devil is actually my own doing. And so I need to understand my opponents. Now, here's the problem. My opponents are all teamed together. Only one receives the prize. It's either going to be me or the team, which is the world, flesh, and the devil, that's against me. We're all not going to win. We all cannot win. But one is going to receive it. So number one, I need to understand my opponents. But number two, I need to understand what this race is all about. I need to not only understand the opposition, but I need to understand the outcome. So run that ye may obtain the outcome. There's going to be an outcome. Did you know that either we're either going to go by the way of the grave or we're going to go by the way of the cloud? The Lord Jesus is going to come. But one way or the other, there is a time appointed for us to leave this world. And we're going to have a reckoning day when we stand before the Lord Jesus at the at the judgment seat of Christ for who are, who are saved. And, and we need to understand we're going to win the, the prize. And by the way, the prize is not my salvation. I don't win a prize called salvation because I ran good enough, I was good enough or anything. Salvation is a free gift. But after I'm saved, then I'm running the race, and then I am able to win the rewards and the prizes that would be there for those who are faithful, faithful before God. But here's the problem. In that verse of scripture I just read you a moment ago, it says, they run all. Now, what it means by they run all, every opponent that's against me, they all run together. They don't take a break. They don't stop. They don't give up. They may not win this particular skirmish, but that doesn't discourage them. They're going to come at you in another way. And so they're running all. But not only that. They are going to run to win. Have you ever been around people that they didn't care? If, you know, I, I, I'm very competitive. I'm not as good as, in competition as I used to be in anything. I tried to grow hair one time and I lost. But anyway, um, we all are, you know, should be competitive. But have you ever been around somebody, they just didn't, and they're on your, then they're on your team, and they don't have any gumption. You know what gumption is? That's from Tennessee. You know, they just don't have any life, any spirit about them. They could care if their team wins or not. And they don't, if it's a tug of war, they're not even trying. They don't try about anything. But my opponent, they run all, and they are willing to win at any cost. No, no matter what the cost, there is nothing off limits to them. So I need to understand that there is a prize to be had, and if I'm going to run, I need to run that I may obtain that prize. So let's look at three thoughts about running our race out of these three verses of Scripture, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Number one, I want you to notice our course. Look at verse number one again. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run, let, excuse me, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, did you know that you have a course and I have a course, and they're all different courses? I like what Paul wrote in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 4 and verse number 7. He says that I have finished my course. Now, I love the emphasis on the word my course. 
because again, that keeps us out of each other's lanes. We're not fighting against each other. We're not running against, against each other. But we've all got a course. Can I tell you what happened with my course? I was saved on August the 1st, 1971. So this coming August, August the 1st, the Lord made sure I was saved on an easy day, uh, the, the first day of the month. If it's, if it's a, you know, the 12th or something like that, I'd never remember that. August the 1st, 1971, that's when I was saved. And I had my plans of doing what I wanted to do. I had my friends. I mean, we were a tight-knit group there in Bradley County, Tennessee. Tight-knit group. Went to high school together. Gone, started college. Everything was just going the way I, I, you know, it should go. And uh, then God had other plans. He brought the Word of God in my life. The gospel and, and the Holy Spirit began to convict my life. But, but I received Christ as my Savior. And then... Two weeks after I was saved, I began to feel like God wanted me to preach. Now, I mentioned a Sunday school. I didn't even, or before, whatever, whenever. Sometime this week, I mentioned to you all this morning about I didn't even know where the book of Hezekiah was. I was ignorant. I didn't know that how many books there were in the Bible, but I felt God wanted me to preach. And so I surrendered. I didn't know I was supposed to run from God. I surrendered. Now, from, the, from where I lived in Cleveland, Tennessee, we had about 100 Baptist churches, and I was saved in a Baptist church. So I thought, well, I'll, and the way it worked in our, in our town, Brother Davenport, uh, the preacher would stay there a year or two three at the most either he'd leave on his own or they'd carry him off one or the other but he was leaving that church and he'd go to the next church and the next church and the next church and and that was his life he worked his job and and that was it so I waited you know I, I waited no, nobody called me to preach nobody or called me to pastor and I waited and I waited nobody called me to pastor but here I'm on my course I'm trying I'm trying to be faithful I'm teaching Sunday school I'm doing what I, and I'm waiting for some church to call me to pastor nobody called me to pastor and all of a sudden we started having missionaries come to our church, and God began to deal with my heart about being a missionary. And here I'm trying to run my race, and I thought, wait a minute, I, I'm from Tennessee. We're a hick, a hick family from Tennessee. I mean, I, and now if I go to I go to, to the mission field, I'm going to have to learn a new language. I, well, i got to start learning English first, then learn whatever other language, and here we go. And, running. and so a, few, a year later, we surrendered to go to Africa, you know, and here I'm running my race. My, my race is different from your race. We all have a different race. Uh, I spoke to Brother Davenport's granddaughter. Her race has taken her into the skies, beyond the blue, you know. But we all have a different race to run. God is the one that will give us our race. I believe it's not of my choosing, but it's God's will for my life to run the race I have set before me. But when I think about the course that I have, did you know that when a person is going to run this race, there's a few things about him that he need to, that, that, ra that runner needs to understand, and we all need to understand, that this race involves training, training, discipline. Without discipline, you're not going to win anything. I, I, I remember a few years ago, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, you've got some issues in your life going on and you got some sugar issues and my wife never did think I was too sweet but the doctor evidently did uh, you got some sugar issues and you know and he said you're gonna have to lose some weight you got to get some things under control you got to control your diet and here my goodness here we go but it called for discipline I'm an undisciplined person do you know how long it takes me to get up in the morning to get this part straight I'm undisciplined I don't care if it's ever which way you know but it you know Undisciplined, but if I'm going to accomplish my race, I'm going to have to train for my race. Whatever your race is, you got to train for it. So it calls for discipline in your life. And it says in that verse of scripture, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about it with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every weight. And so it calls for discipline in my life to be able to lay, a weight, uh, lay aside these weights. I've got to cast them off. I've got to get rid of them. Whatever it is in my life that is going to hinder me from being able to run my race, I've got to get rid of it. Pride or whatever, I've got to get rid of the thing that runs my race. And you know what I found out? There is nothing so insignificant that I should ever, ever ignore because the smallest thing can defeat me. I'm talking about me, Dean Hamby, things in my life that I've got to say, you know what? This absolutely is not worth it. Lay it aside. Whether it's laying in bed like I love to lay in bed or whatever, I've got to lay aside me and mine and run the race that God has for me because you know what? I don't want my opponent. I've got enough in me that calls me. I don't want my opponents to win the race. I want to run, the, run and win the race that I have. So I've got to lay it aside. You know what? You know the re reason they pay professional um, ball players and professional sports people? You know the re reason they pay them a full salary that are professional? Because they wanted them to devote 
100% of their time and effort to that sport. They're going to train. They're going to practice. They're going to be able to go to every game. They're not going to have to work another job. They want them to be totally focused, totally surrendered to that job, to that, to that game, to that sport. That's why people who are in the Olympics, they get sponsors, people to help them, so they are not distracted even with a job or anything so that they can focus on the Olympic Games so that they can be the very best that they can be and win the crown, win the prize. So the discipline... I've got to lay aside everything that would take away my focus. I've got to lay everything aside that is going to disrupt my fitness to be able not to start because there's a lot of people that start running, but they don't finish the race. I've got to lay it aside, and I've got to go full steam ahead. That means I've got to change everything in my life to be exactly what I should be to be able to do what I need to do to finish my course. So I start my race. Lay aside every weight. And the sin, my next word is the word discernment. And the sin, I've got to lay, away these, lay aside these weights. These weights not, may not necessarily be wrong in themselves, but if they hinder me, they hinder me. I've got to lay them aside. But the next one, and the sin, I've got to lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. You name the sin. I probably think, you know, you probably think, and I think when you say lay aside the sin, something might pop in your head. What is that thing that so easily comes in your life? What is that thing that is there? But this word beset, you know what that word literally means? It means to encircle you, to be around about you. I remember one day over, over in the book of 2 Samuel, I remember here was the king of Syria, Ben Hadad. Wouldn't you love to have, hey dad, Ben, hey dad. But anyway, hey dad, Ben, excuse me, Ben Hadad came and he was going to fight against the king of Israel. And every time he would come with his army, here was Elisha. He was over there and he'd, he'd get word to the, uh, the king of Israel. He said, don't go here because Syrian army is over there. And he'd send people over. Sure enough, they were there. And then all of a sudden, now they're everywhere. So Ben Hadad, he said, wait a second, guys, somebody is for uh, as, as, as against me and for Israel. I got a spy in my midst. And they said, we don't have a spy here. You know who's telling the king of Israel? It's Elisha. It's Elisha. So you know what Ben-Hadad did? He sent his army over to the town of Dothan where Elisha was staying. And so early one morning, the servant of Elisha, he gets up and he goes out. And when he gets out, it's just daybreak. And all of a sudden, you know what he sees? He sees the whole Syrian army has encircled the, the city, the town of Dothan. Man, he gets shook up. He runs back and he says, Alas, my father, how shall we do? Another what in the world are we going to do to get out of this mess we got into here? We can't escape. We're... And so Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. And around about that army was another army. It was the army of the Lord that God has sent to protect Elisha. But that's what this word is. It means to encircle. And we have things in our life that encircle us. I don't know if you remember this. But in 1968, the Olympic Games were, in, were held in Mexico City. The fastest mile runner in the world was a man by the name of Jim Ryan. I was, back in those days, we didn't have television. It had just come out. And um, we were watching it live as much as live could be back in those days. And so uh, we were watching, I was watching the Olympics. And here's Jim Ryan. Everybody, Jim Ryan was going to win. It was, a, it was a sure thing Jim Ryan would win the race. So here they start, and Jim Ryan would always kind of lay more toward the back, kind of in the back of the pack, and, and he'd let somebody else set the pace, but here's Jim Ryan, and everybody's watching Jim Ryan and waiting for him to make his move, you know, and all of a sudden, another runner trips Jim Ryan. See, that's what, that's what the devil wants to do to me and you. He wants us to trip us up. We're running our race. We've got confidence we can win the race. The people in the stands have got confidence we're going to, run, we're going to win this race. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a surefire thing. He had already run against these people before. He had, he had won against them every time, and it's a surefire thing. He is going to win. But somebody that he did not expect tripped him, tripped him. We've got to have discernment. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to be watching. There can never be a moment in our life where we let down our guard. Why? We need to be like the Apostle Paul. When, Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul was finishing up his life and he's writing this letter to Timothy, and with confidence Paul said, I have finished my course. Paul, had, he had vigilance. Whether he was in prison, he didn't let his guard down. Whether he's preaching on the street, he didn't let his guard down. Whatever he was doing, he always was vigilant. 
vigilant discernment. Number three, determination. He says in the latter part of that verse of Scripture, he says, And the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The race, to run with patience. I've got to have determination. Now, I, I, when I was reading this just, uh, again, I was reading this uh, this week, and I read run with patience. You know, really, those two words don't really, in my mind, go together. Run and Running and patience just don't kind of go together. If you're going to run, just run, you know. But run with patience. You know why? Because this is not a sprint. This is an endurance race. Can I go back to Jim Ryan for just a moment? Jim Ryan, when he was tripped, the guy that tripped him, you know what he did? He got up and he walked off the track. He didn't finish. We've got to have determination. Can I tell you what Jim Ryan did? Jim Ryan had determination. Can I tell you what else Jim Ryan had? He had character. The one guy, the guy that tripped Jim Ryan, got up and walked off the tra track. <laughs> have no idea who the man was. Don't know what country he was from. Jim Ryan got up because Jim Ryan was determined to finish the race. You know what he did? He got up and he got back in his same pace and he went. He came in last. But can I tell you what he did? He finished the race. He was determined. We have a lot of people that get tripped up, they quit, and they never finish the race. Can I tell you, we're all going to get tripped up. We all going to tr get tripped up. We're all going to fall. We're all going to get skint knees. We're all going to have, you know, I don't believe you lived very much if you hadn't got at least a bruise or two on your body, a few scars on you. But he had determination. And he says, let us run with patience. You know what that word, it means, it means and, in, and a cheerful courage. A cheerful courage to be able to do in spite of what everybody does, you're going to finish your course. So that's the course. We need to run with patience. We need to pace ourselves. Number two, I want you to look back at verse number one. We want to see the cloud. He says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so cloud, a great cloud of witnesses, let us run. Let us run. Let us, or let us lay aside and then let us run. So notice the cloud. I, I'm not going to get into all, all that people think about the cloud, but I'm just going to tell you what I think about the cloud. But the important thing is, is to know that we are encircled by a cloud of witnesses. He didn't say here crowd, but cloud. When I think about a cloud, I think about the sky. I think about up. And did you know everywhere in the world, except, maybe except for the Sahara Desert, uh, there's clouds everywhere. When we look up, we can see a cloud. Here in Kentucky, you've got your more than your fair share of clouds, i got to tell you that. But anyway, uh, a cloud of witnesses. Now, what I think about this cloud of witnesses, I go back to chapter number four, uh, chapter number 11. Those verses of Scripture, he deals with people. He starts off with Abel, and then he goes to Enoch, and then Noah, and all these people in this chapter of people, some that we have that he didn't give a name, but we see all these people, and they had a race to run. Abel's race was, was, we say, cut short. It wasn't cut short. Abel ran his race. He finished his race. God had a race for him from start to finish, for, for him from start to finish, and he finished the course. His brother killed him, but he's finished his course. And all of them finished the course that we, we find in chapter number 11. You find people like Samson. I thought, good night. Why would Samson be in this hall of faith there with all of the wicked things that he had in his life? But you know what? He had faith, and he was able to overcome, and he lived a life that was able for him to be put in the hall of faith. So you got people that are glorious in their whole life. They were just glorious people. You have others that weren't so glorious, but yet they had faith and they had a course and they ran their course. And we have this great cloud of witnesses. But here's what I thought about. You know what? We have a lot of people that are named here, but we got a whole lot more that are not named here in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, people that have gone on before us. I think about recently all some men of God that have gone on and people that stayed true to God, they finished their course. And can I tell you what they are? They are that cloud of witnesses. They are there. And their testimony is that if I did it, you can do it. We can be encouraged today that, yes, we've got it bad. I don't know. Listen, I think I said this on Wednesday night. I don't know what we're getting ready to go into. Our country is in the shape that I've never seen in my short life. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I was saved right at the, right at the end of, of the Korean War and, and patriotism. People that, people that do things today, man, people would have hauled them off back in the day. 
But we have things that are going. We're on a course today that I, if something doesn't change, I don't know that we've got much longer to go as a country as we know it today where we can get in a car and we can come to church. We've already been tested with that here in this last year about things. We've got to be understanding today. We don't know where this is going. We don't know what we're going to face. We don't know what our children, our young people are going to face. We have no idea. But I do know this, that God has given us a course. We are here. We're running the race, and we're here. And if those people did it, we can do it. And do you know also not only the people that have gone on, but again, Brother Davenport mentioned in Sunday school this prayer request about people that are persecuted for their faith today, that are suffering today. And can I tell you, if they can do it, we can do it. You say, but I don't. Hey, you're looking at a guy. Uh, somebody says, you got to be, you got to be, you can't be a wimp to, to get old. Let me tell you something, I'm a wimp. You say, you can't be a sissy and go, oh, I'm a, I'm a sissy. I'm going kicking and screaming into old age. I, I, I ain't a kidding. I don't like pain. It hurts. I, I want everybody to like me. You know, uh, that's what good looking people are. You know, we just want people to like us. But, but can I tell you, I don't know what, I don't know. You know, it's one thing about the course. Athletes, they know their course. They always know their course. They've already tried the course out. But I'm running a race where I have never been on this course before. I don't know where my course is going. I, I think about in chapter number three of the book of Joshua, when they, or chapter number two rather, when they were getting ready to cross the Jordan River, God told Joshua to tell the people to put 2,000 uh, 2, cubits between them and the Ark of the Covenant. 2,000 cubits. Why? God wanted them to be able to see the Ark. No matter who they were, or no matter where they were, they could see the ark because there was a distance between them and the ark. And here's what, he, here's what God told Joshua to tell the people. For ye have not come this way heretofore. In other, way, in other words, you have no idea where you're going. So you need to be able to see the one that will guide you and lead you where you're going. So that you'll be able to get to where you are being led to go. So I've got a great cloud of witnesses that have done it. They've been faithful. People that are doing it, that are faithful. And let me tell you something. Let me not be one of those that gets up after I tripped on the course and walk off and be a failure. So we have a cloud. Number three, I want you to notice our cause. Can I go back to the people that have, been, have suffered for their faith that are suffering today? in China, in Muslim countries, even here in America where you have people that have a mom and dad, a husband or wife. We had a, man, I had a lady at our church many years ago in Cleveland, Tennessee. She got saved and she started coming to our church with her two little twin daughters. Her husband was lost, short, fused temper. One Sunday evening she was getting ready to, to leave the house to come to church and he grabbed her he slammed her up against the wall, yanked the Bible out of her hand, threw it across the floor, and he said, you're not leaving this house. She said, I got to go. She went over and picked up the Bible, and when the Bible was slung across the floor, the back of the Bible, the covering of the Bible tore off, and she picked up the Bible. She caught her little girls and came home, and she was under persecution. Even here in America, we have children that are beaten, here in America, wives that are beaten, people that are mistreated, even in America, right here where we are, all of the things that we see happening. By the way, the man that slammed his wife against the wall, he got saved not long after that, and God called him to preach. And God good. Pastoring today, I talked to him. I, he's on my prayer list. I, I pray for Brother Clarence, him and, and his family. God is so good. But can I tell you, we are in a race. So what would cause people? To go through the problems, the trials, the difficulties that they may not ever have in this life, in this life, had they not chosen to follow the Lord and run the race. What would cause them to do that? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I remember 
David in chapter number one of the book of 1 Samuel. David was sent by his father over to see how the war was going, the Philistines against the Israelites. And, and uh, he, he said, go over and see how the boys are doing, getting along. And he, he sent him some cheese and some bread. You know what cheese and bread makes, right? Cheese sandwiches. Anyway, uh, sits, takes cheese and bread over there, see how things are going. He gets over there, and here's this giant down there, this, this big guy giant down there named Goliath and he's out there defying the armies of God and when the people of God see him uh, see the giant they all take off and run and David's like what is going on here and so he, he starts what is this and and the, he, and the king he said well the king said if you will defeat the giant uh, whoever de- kills the giant he's going to give him his daughter to marry he's going to uh, he's going to give him some money he's going to make him not have to pay taxes I mean just a wonderful thing and David's like, what I mean, for doing God's will, I'm going to get all that, you know. So he, his brother Eli, he's over there watching David. What's going on here? He calls him over there. See, big brother, David, uh, David is the youngest brother. Eli's the oldest. He begins to pick, to pick him up and chew him out. What are you doing coming over here? And why was he there? Because daddy told him to go. But he's over there. What are you doing? I know you're just over here to see the war. And I mean, you're, oh, he's a letting him have it. And here's what David says. Is there not a cause? David knew that there was something that was bigger than all of them that was greater. You know what that was? The honor and glory of God was greater than him or them. The honor and glory of God. I, I look at chapter, uh, verse number two and three of this chapter, and, and I, I got to tell you, there is a purpose. There is a cause that's greater than me and you. Would you notice verse number two and verse number three? He starts out looking unto Jesus. Look at verse number three. He says, consider him. In those two verses of Scripture, he wants us to stop. We're running our race. We're running our race. You know what he says? Wait a second. If you're going to win this race, I want you to stop. And I want you to consider something. I want you to understand something. When I got saved, I had my best friends in the world. I mean, the best friends I could ever have. We were through thick and thin. I mean, how much can you go through in high school? But we are through thick and thin. You know, we were through the back. But I got saved. My friends that were dear to me, they turned their backs on me. I started going to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night. I started witnessing to people. I was reading my Bible. I wanted to know more. And my, th- my friends turned their back on me. They mocked me. Wanted nothing to do with me. All of them. All of them. But can I tell you, there's a cause that's greater than me and greater than you, greater than family, greater than children. It's him. Because I want you to know what I cannot do and what your family cannot do, he can do for you and your family and your church. And there's a cause. There's a cause. But he says, you got to stop. Because if I continue running for me, in my flesh, in my strength, and my energy, I am going to absolutely fail. I'm going to fall on the track. I'm going to bring a disgrace and reproach to the one that loves me. Can I tell you verse number two and three? Can I tell you? He's not, he's not just a historical character. He's not, th- this crucifixion is not just some historical event that happened. I mean, he, he lived in this world, the very son of God. God, robed in flesh, came into this world. And he lived his life for one purpose, and that was the cross. In verse number two, he talks about how he endured the cross, despising the shame. Verse number three, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider it. I look at this word, this word consider, you know what it means to evaluate proportionately, evaluate proportionately, to look at it. It's kind of like a, you, you got a car, you got an old car, and you're going to take it up there, and you're going to go to the car lot, and uh, you're going to check it in. So that salesman comes out there, and he evaluates your car. He's going to find out what the worth is. That's what he says in verse 3. He says, consider him. Stop and evaluate him. You know what our father is today? So here comes this used car salesman. 
calls himself a worm. I look at that word worm. You know what the word worm means? It doesn't mean a herd of worms. A herd of worms good for something. It keeps the dirt chunked up. It can just take a worm, put it on a hook, and go catch a fish. But in Psalm 22, when the Lord is called a worm, he's called a worm, which means a maggot. Tell me what a maggot's good for. Breeds flies, breeds disease. And Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, all glory, all glory wrapped up in human flesh, comes to this world and makes of himself a maggot. Lord from below, despised and rejected, not evaluated, me and him. Would you do that for him? Would you do that for anything? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friends. Consider him. Evaluate. There were three that evaluated him. And I'm going to close. The first one evaluated him was a man by the name of Judas. And Judas, he went to the high priest and he said, How much will you give me to betray him? Can I tell you? God evaluated his son. And the cross said, Again. closed. You may be here this morning. I remember 18 years old, sitting in a church, four rows back, left my pew and I received Christ as my Savior. You know what I realized? I realized that morning that me going to hell wasn't worth the price of sitting there in that pew and not having people laugh at me. I walked forward and I received him as my Savior. Greatest thing I ever did in my life. Consider him. You may be here today lost and you need a Savior. Can I tell you, there is no Savior but him. He is the only way to God. He died on the cross. He suffered. He bled on the cross. 
paid his life's blood for me and for you. I like what one preacher said. He said, the cross was the marketplace where God bought man, paid for his sins. But he went on to say, but God didn't get his money's worth when he bought me. He truly did not get his money's worth when he bought me. What about us this morning as we consider him? If you're saved today, do you love him? Do you live for him? Do you make your life count? Do people see that you really do care for him and love him? We're going to give an invitation today. If you feel like you need to come and pray, I'm sure would invite you to come, either here in the front or at your pew. But let's consider him this morning. Father, I pray you'll have your will and way in all of our hearts and lives. Bless this invitation time. Thank you for the goodness of God to us. Thank you for the love of God. Please have your way, I pray in Jesus' name.